And a term that we're hearing more and more of is that, that wonderful oxymoron, creation science. What's, yeah. what's that all about? Um, well, um, there have been various attempts, mostly in America, to subvert scientific education. And uh, in America, it's taboo to teach religion in science classes. There's a constitutional prohibition against bringing religion in to, to uh, classes. So there have been various ruses to get around this, and one of them is called creation science. It, it then resurfaced under another name, intelligent design theory. It's identical. Uh, but you change the name in order to smuggle things through. Creation science um, was sh uh, um, struck down in an important American court, I forget exactly when, uh, and was shown in the court to be religion, and therefore it was reinvented as intelligent design, which was again struck down much more recently in Dover, Pennsylvania. Um, there was a rather interesting um, piece of evidence that was brought before the Dover court. A, a textbook called Of Pandas and People had been written for the earlier creation science manifestation of this nonsense, and it had creation, creation, creation throughout the book. And then a new edition of the book came out that had intelligent design instead of creation. And it was actually literally done by a Microsoft Word type cut and, cut and paste. I mean, you know, su substitute the word intelligent design for creation science wherever you find it. And there was one, I forget exactly what it was, but there was one key place where, where they got it wrong. And so you could actually tell. It said just something like Cree, and then, and then, the, then the rest of intelligent design. I forget exactly how it worked. It reminds me a little bit of the story that um, a, a literary agent t told me of a, of a novelist who had written a novel about um, a man called David. And the, when the novel was just about to go to finally pub publication, to go to final press, the novelist decided that this, his character wasn't really a David. He seemed more like a Kevin. So he went right through with a word processor saying, you know, wherever you, the computer was told, wherever you find David, substitute Kevin, which was fine, except that the hero went to Florence. <laughs> I see you're ahead of me, okay. Um, my final question to you, Richard, is um, Charles Darwin himself was very, very circumspect about religion. He was very cautious about criticizing it very publicly, um, very concerned not to cause offense to the religious. Um, in this respect, at least, it would appear you're rather different from your hero. Um, yes. Um, and is that wise? Well, um, Darwin was cautious. He was a gentleman, as well as a gentleman. He was um, a, a, one of the nicest men you could possibly meet. It's perfectly clear that from, from reading about him and reading him what an utterly delightful, kind, gentle man he was, and he hated getting into acrimonious arguments. He left that to T.H. Huxley and others, and uh, Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. And uh, so Darwin, in a sense, didn't need to uh, be controversial because he had Huxley and Hooker and others to, to do that for him. Nowadays, there is a controversy among evolutionary scientists as to how politically we should handle the problem, especially in, uh, in America. And I do get fairly heavily criticized by some of my scientific <coughs> colleagues for, I suppose in a sense, doing what Huxley did as opposed to doing what Darwin did. Um, I have been told, for example, that I am the best weapon that creationists have got because, or I and people like me, uh, are the best weapon that, uh, that the creationists have got because I'm prepared to say that evolution, my understanding of evolution, is one of the main things that led me to atheism. And if you say that in America to a creationist, they will say, aha, we told you so. That's exactly what we've been saying all along. They've all been brought up to believe that there is an incompatibility between uh, religion and evolution, which would be denied, and rightly so, 
by, I, at least I, I, I won't, I, I'm not sure about that, um, which would be denied by any bishop, archbishop, uh, rabbi, um, who would say, yes, of course you can be an evolutionist and you can be religious as well. There's no incompatibility between them at all. Nevertheless, a large number of people in America have been told that they are absolutely incompatible. And therefore, if you tell them you're an atheist, they will say, right, well, religion comes first, religion takes, takes priority, um, evolution must be wrong, because um, it's evolution that's led you to be, to be an atheist. Um, well, I've been criticized along those lines, as I say. Uh, for me, winning the battle over evolution in, in American schools is not the, the sole object of the exercise. I'm at least as interested in the truth of whether there actually is a god or not. Uh, and therefore, um, I'm not prepared to compromise on what I see as the big question in the interests of winning a political battle in America, many of my colleagues are. Many of my colleagues are, are very happy to get into bed with the bishops and vicars, uh, who and who will, and they will say yes, yes, yes. Um, religion and evolution go hand in hand. I suppose I could be slightly mischievous and say that m my way of putting it would be if all those people have been brought up by their pastors in the deep south to believe that there is a total incompatibility between religion and evolution, 